us today. Uh -huh. um, do you have any questions about the project before we go? Yeah. Uh, no, you can just tell me anything you want to tell me. Okay, sir. great. Do you want to get a clap? Yeah, we're speeding a bull. All right. The frame? Yes. Yes. All right. Um, so for uh, establishing purposes, would you please introduce yourself? What's up? I'm Kanye West. Did you ever meet Jay Dilla? Yes, I did. I met Jay Dilla at Commons Crib, uh, just down the street here in LA. They were staying together. And I just remember looking at that MPC and thinking like, those drums came out of that MPC. Like, you know, arguably the best drums in hip hop history. And just remember just vibing with, with, with him and having so much respect and just wanted to work with him more. What was the time like that you two spent together? Was it focused around music? Yeah, we, we only focus on music. Me and Common, you know, we'll go play basketball and go to the movies and, and hang and all that. But uh, me and Dilla, we just, you know, focus on just tracks. He had the organic feel, but still the sonics would break through. And he could give you a warm sound that still cut through speakers. It's like he was making Quincy Jones production sessions just inside of his MPC. You know, like most producers, you know, that can make music that knocks, which is like 90% of producers can make things that knock, especially with uh, Fruity Loops and all that. The sound was usually colder. And then my sound is known for being very colorful and warm, but sometimes I'd be challenged on my mixes that everything didn't knock as hard as I wanted to. Or maybe by the time it came out, it did, but people didn't realize they did 27 mixes to get to that point. But Dilla, every time, it's like that kick just sat so perfectly. And like the, um, his swings, his shuffles on his beats, his snare choices, his, the way he sampled shit, it was just like, it just sounded like, felt like drugs. I mean, his music just sounded like good pussy. To the layman who doesn't necessarily understand the, the process of isolating, you know, different sounds and drum beats and, and how those, those are sort of layered like textures, could you describe that? Yeah, well, you know, when you first start producing, you can start from sampling, you can start from programming a kick drum, a hi-hat and a snare, and then you know, you, you, you start from like, you know, my first beat to, you know, getting to the level of like the masters that use sampling and, you know, they sample drums from the 70s and the 60s and, you know, mix it with some sample from the 80s and a little word sample from KRS or something on top of it, you know, or uh, a James Brown scream. And this combination is, um, you know, it's how people define their textures and who they are. And the hip hop producers, you know, are very similar to uh, the fashion designers. And that's one of the reasons why I'm so interested in fashion is because the same thing. People sample from like a, they'll take a military jacket and, you know, and modernize it. So we would take, uh, you know, like I'll take an Otis Red and sample and modernize it. And, you know, you know texturally what, you know, what Margiela was to fashion is is really similar to what Dilla was to music. It's, it really parallels a lot because Margiela would do these interesting, you know, flips and abstract flips of the way you know um, um, the way you think about like a a bracelet. You take a, like a small ring and make it like an oversized bracelet, or flip a jacket inside out, or cut all the edges really raw, and that that rawness is. You know, that's what people are looking for, that reality, that life. It's like you want good and bad. You want salt and pepper. You want uh, hot and sweet. And um, he was able to capture all that and then sometimes just give you such an, a, an amazingly emotional, emotional, like, connective, like, melody. I don't know if connective is a word, but I just, I, I create my own language. I don't give a fuck. So, um... And, you know, that's what he is, because as hip-hop producers, we were all designers in a way. So perhaps maybe I was like, 
the Mark Jacobs of hip hop, and then he was like more like the Marshall of hip hop, and you know, um, Pete Rock was the John Paul Gaultier or something of hip hop, and then you know, Q Tip was the Galliano or something. It's like all these because I, I do this this comparison of creators, and also you could do that same comparison to like the Coen Brothers or Tarantino, the way they put textures in. Like, I think Tarantino is like Wu-Tang to me. So I always like, you know, do all these like ways that creatives parallel. So. Yeah, how do you feel that uh, Dylan's roots being from Detroit, um, how he was affected by Motown, how that influenced his production and how that brought Motown sampling to the forefront of hip-hop at that time? Uh, yeah, I just, you know, I got... Uh, a, a special place in my heart for anyone from like the Midwest um, and I think that because it's in the middle of America and you know so close to Motown which was my my favorite my favorite record label of all time was Motown you know that form that, that era of music was my favorite now, my favorite artist is James Brown, and I also love Stax. Like, to me, like, Motown and Stax are like Bad Boy and Rough Riders at the height, you know? So you got, like, Biggie, and then you got DMX, or you, you could add Rockefeller in with that mix or something. Um, and anyone, like, with that, with that connection to that place, I mean, if you look at, like, the, 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 the two top Grammy winners of all time are from Chicago. And like, I'm like on this like path to like, you know, be the top Grammy winner of all time. The, that Midwestern feel of that middle America soul, people coming up from the South, the heritage and the music and that, being born in that culture, you know, the purest, the greatest, you know, musicians come out of that environment. Also, just the struggle that we deal with in those environments, you know, where you're fighting, you know, you're fighting for your freedom, you're fighting for your economic equality with your talent. That's all you got. There's no other chance right there. And, you know, that pressure bust pipes, you know, you're gonna, you know, something great, a rose is gonna grow out of that concrete. And that's, you know, Dillo is definitely one of those roses. Um, around the time you released the College Dropout, Dill put out his first album with Mad Lib and Stone's Throw, uh, Jailer's Champion Sound. Mm -hmm. uh, could you talk about that time of hip-hop, that project specifically? That's the one that has stars on it? The, uh, the cover's just like a rubber tire. I remember the cover, though. It's like right when you said it, it's like, I see the, the Jailer font uh, popping up. I mean... I guess maybe a better way to phrase that is how are their styles different, similar, and then also complementary to each other? Well, I just think that um, Uh, Dilla maybe perhaps might have been a bit more of a scientist, perfectionist, and Mad Lib might have just been a bit more crazy, just MF Doom, ODB, you know, with it, and that combination is like, you know, that juxtaposition was uh, what made it, you know, so impactful. Yeah. And also, the fact that that is there, you know, and my respect for that and the fact that I came from that underground place is that is the balance, that is the anchor for a college dropout to work, that it has to be anchored in an entire community of people that, um, you know, believed in a certain type of uh, anti-radio music. And, and I, you know, I guess radio has a connotation because so many people are like, it's so formulaic when people figure out a formula that works for radio. There's no one that's like, 
so few people are like fighting against it and people that are fighting against it don't have the opportunities or you know they get like completely compressed or and then that's when you get things like the American Music Awards when you see it you're just like why the fuck would I watch this you know where and it's it's to the point where it's like there is no Michael Jackson anymore and you literally got like you know, pop stars, you know, copying what Mike did and copying what MC Hammer did. There is, that purity is not there because the system compresses, you know, talent so much and tries to demonize the truth, you know, so they can control and sell product and shit. And that's why it's like such a shame when you lose like amazing people who are so rooted in what they do and they just don't give a fuck about anything else because they know, you know, money or no money, how important it is. It's like when you can, you know, be above the concept of money or something, you know. I'm lucky because I'm from Chicago and because I'm from Chicago, I don't give a fuck. So I care, but don't give a fuck. That's what it is. Like a Chicago, someone from Chicago is very sincere. They got their heart like that, but well, they don't give a fuck about what anybody is saying as long as it's from their heart. And that's like what it is to be from Chicago, be from the Midwest. You know, this ain't no like fake ass or something. We ain't smiling for people and stuff like that. So if you put me in a uh, position like that, you know. So I imagine it, it could be harder for people that are trying to fit in you know, or, or people who are trying to, or people who have just like not, you know, been successful in doing exactly what they want to do. They have to compromise, you know, have families to feed, they have this and that, and they got to figure out how to make that money. You know, I'm like extremely spoiled and extremely blessed to be able to do songs like Jesus Walks and for them to work. Songs like Can't Tell Me Nothing. For me to be able to keep it real and really make money off of being real is an extremely blessed situation, but it's also a responsibility. So it means like, okay, you've been given this opportunity to be like an inspiration, to be, you know, in the lineage of what Dilla did and what most Def and quality and all that. It's like, um, but you can never forget that. You can never forget about what the the point is, the the message, what hip hop is about, what like public enemy is about. No fuck a Maybach, you know, respect to the Maybach family because I know them. But you know what I'm saying? I just feel like I feel like people are controlled with like money and perception and they're very fearful. And as an artist, man, Raphael painted Jesus' wife in that last supper painting, you know, knowing the Pope was gonna kill him. So but as an artist, hey, this is what's gonna happen. So I imagine I mean people just deal with humanity and some people are meant to look like and like fight the war head on and some people are meant to like run in their house. So so I'm saying all that to say as far as how difficult it is. You know, I imagine it's extremely difficult if you can't get paid to do exactly what you want. Then you're, the, the blessing of life is having a job that's exactly, you know, a, if you have a job, you know, where you're doing what you love, you never work a day in your life. Yeah. In 2006, Dylan passed. Um, mm -hmm. Could you describe the impact his death had on you, um, the artists? you collaborated with and, and mentored in the hip hop community at large? I mean, it's extremely shocking. And I think as a an artist, we look at it more selfishly than anything. You know, when Biggie passed, when Dilla passed, you know, because as artists, we give of ourselves and so you know, he was giving the world so much. Biggie was giving the world so much. Pac was giving the world so much. It was, they were giving all of all they had. So um, to lose that, it's like we, lo we lost another point of inspiration. And, um, you know, it's amazing, you know, how could we lose you know, Biggie, Pac, you know, Dilla, Steve Jobs, Michael Jackson, 
it, you know, it'll almost make you feel like the devil's winning. Like the fucking system is winning and shit because all these people that, you know, fought so hard. You know, and that's what gives me like my fight. Just thinking like I have to work on behalf of Dilla. I have to like, when I put a weird ass fucking this Jamaican sample, it's like it works at first, but it's not till I put like the that it sounds like art or sounds slightly wrong. And now we'll go to the radio, now that it's wrong, motherfucker. Now play this, play this five minute song that completely fucks up your programming. Like play this, you know, that's, you know, that's a lineage of, it's, it's, it's the best respect that we can pay to like great artists that have inspired us so much is to never fucking Never sell out. We gotta fight. You know, you, we gotta make music and we think like, if Dilla was alive, would he like this? Is, if Biggie was alive, would he, would, would he respect what we're doing now? You know, when we name the song Niggas in Paris, that shit is like, so brash. You know, and if Grammys don't nominate that as song of the year, then fuck them. You know, and, and we keep the shit hip hop and, um, and we just keep it moving. <laughs> That's all it is, you know. This might be a little redundant, but I wanted to address it. Uh, in 2011 at the Brooklyn Hip Hop Festival, Q-Tip said of the feelings you elicit in him, I only felt like this when I met Dilla. Uh, mm. What do you think Tip meant by that? Man, it's just Midwest dude that knows how to chop samples. That like, you know, there's rules of hip hop. But it's funny because like my girl bought me this chain and shit. And like, you know, there was like this kind of anti thing that people are really strong and like anti jewelry, anti this. And, you, and we all know Dilla was definitely on the side of like wearing some jewelry. But to have that juxtaposition was so weird for someone to be so, so talented and still wear jewelry because it, it felt like at a certain point like the jewelry wearers were the less talented. But I could see through it and be like, wait a second, Jay Z's like really talented though. Regardless if the you know, backpacker hates jewelry or not. And Dilla was on that side. And I think I just gave like a really similar Midwestern vibe. It's so funny because like Kamal just hit me today and shit was like, yo, can you get on the phone? And it's like, um, you know, um, you know, just those, those legends that inspire us. And plus we, we are 100%, 1000% inspired by Q-Tip too though. So it's like, basically what he's saying is like, I feel like we're men, me and Dilla are like the sons he never had. Yeah. Let's return to Madlib. Uh, Quasimodo, Lord Quas, the beat conductor. The list goes on. Uh, who is Otis Jackson Jr. to Kanye West? Well, it's funny because when we were doing Dark Fantasy, you know, I had this, uh, this Madlib joint and the song was No More Parties in L.A. And uh, and RZA told me to not do the song. He's like, yo, because, you know, L.A. niggas going to take it the wrong way and shit. And actually, the sample for it was the same shit I used on the God Flow. I used the Shake That Bond. Because I was like, this is the most amazing fucking sample. And also, that was, you know, Ghostface got that from an old school record also. So, um... It was good just to vibe. I, I went and like met with Doom, and like uh, Mad Lib had this whole this whole record set up in the other room, and Quality came through that night. Um, and it's just those moments where you meet with these people and you understand that you know that this is a culture and a lifestyle and an inspiration for so many, and it's not like a fad, it's not just like a spray painted fucking t-shirt or something, it's like literally, when I was 14, you know, I was considered weird at coming out of Chicago because I was just hip hop as fuck. And it feels like amazing when you can walk into these spaces and, you know, live inside of that creative zone when people just keep it, you know, to that level of purity. Because, you know, the music can be can mean everything and it is everything and like how close you get to those samples and the nuances and the way you chop it up and the people's appreciation for it is an amazing art form and a culture man it's like this shit hip-hop is just as important as Basquiat and Warhol you know 
it's, in, in a way, it seems like it's been made less important because of the importance that it's had to commercial, you know, to commerciality or commercial products or something, you know. So yeah, I give these like weird roundabout answers and shit, but that's, yeah. but sometimes the answer isn't like just black and white like that. It's it's a oh I'm I, I just paint the scene of how I felt sitting there with Mad Lib, you know, working on these tracks and just hearing the textures. And you know, my thing as Kanye West is when I'm working with it, working with Dilla, working with Mad Lib, or working with Tip, or working with RZA, is just to see it and understand what it is I felt about it, that, you know, what Tip or RZA gave me as a kid, because they gave me more than money, you know, they gave me inspiration, you know, and how to, you know, take the elements of greatness and only the elements that can be understood in that year that is coming out and forevermore though. You know, and so a moment like Dark Fantasy or like, you know, like on uh, All the Lights, like Tip added like those weird Jamaican big snares in the back um, or like chain heavy and things like that. So, or even like I still go through old Dilla uh, mixtapes. Matter of fact, now that you brought this up, we have to get like some more Mad Lib beats for the next, you know, the next projects. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, on the heels of that, you know, I remember a couple years ago, um, it was reported that you put my Mad Lib beats on hold. When can we expect to hear something from you two? You know what? I th I'm gonna go back to that song. This one, the No More Parties <laughs> in LA. I'm gonna just like do the rec the record. It was like. Some, um, over the crib, you left your Ray Brands. My, my sheet's still orange from your spray tan. No more parties in LA. No more parties in LA. <laughs> so, some shit. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna load it up. This is during Dark Fantasy. But Dark Fantasy was all about, it was just like no four on the floor. Cause it was like your favorite rappers was douchebagging out and shit. And it was like, we had to like live in the legacy of like Mob Deep, Wu Tang, just period, man. Fuck everything else. <laughs>